The following program is a Perils for Pedestrians special presentation. Okay, this is uh, actually where I spent the, the first two years of my life. This is St. Paul, Minnesota. A uh, wonderful neighborhood uh, that had five and six foot sidewalks everywhere, nice green space with trees, uh, quiet streets, the houses not too far back from the street. Go down the block, there's a little street with shopping. Uh, my parents didn't own a car at the time, they had four kids and so having everything within convenient walking distance was, was quite important to them. And then we moved to Evanston. Uh, once again, nice sidewalk set back by green space. You have the, uh, this is a little apartment building on the corner. We were actually in a, a single family house a few doors down. Uh, but I walked to school starting in kindergarten. And, uh, uh, and actually after we lived there a few years, we inherited my grandfather's car. So we weren't carless the whole time, but uh, it sat around, uh, I think after, uh, when it was 25 years old, it only had 80,000 miles on it, so it didn't get used that much. One of the things that made the neighborhood delightful was, um, you know, you could walk to the, to the store, it wasn't too far away with a little grocery cart, but also had little things like neighborhood rose garden with the fountain in it, that uh, when I was small, that was a wonderful little place that my mother would take us sometimes. And then in the middle of sixth grade, moved to Bethesda, Maryland, uh, this is the uh, street leading up to the elementary school where I went, and there are no sidewalks. There's the elementary school down at the end, and I'm going the same distance to school I was going in Evanston for sixth grade, but now I have to take a bus. And when I made my way to high school in Bethesda, now um, I was walking to high school, but for the first half mile there weren't any sidewalks, and it was always sort of bugging me in the back of my mind when's the county going to build our sidewalks? Well, by the time I got off to college, it occurred to me, the government's not going to build sidewalks until people ask them to build sidewalks, and, uh, which was the letter I wrote in 1980. And it took a little while, a little patience, a little persistence, but, but we did get sidewalks in, in 1997. And it, it actually took a, an act of the state legislature. Um, <laughs> there was a, Maryland is, uh, which was quite backwards as many states are, um, back in the mid-90s passed a bill called Ped Bike Access 2000, which had a lot of good things in it, but one of the things in it was 50-50 matching funds to localities for retrofit sidewalks along state highways. Prior to that, the state would have nothing to do with the sidewalk on the state highway. And the county, discovering that it could get half the money for the sidewalk from the state, all of a sudden became a lot more interested in putting it in because someone else was helping put the bill. Um, but, uh, but even in Bethesda, you go to some of the older neighborhoods. My neighborhood was built in the 50s, but you go over to the neighborhoods that were built in the 30s, and they still knew how to do things for pedestrians back then. They hadn't had this conversion to the car culture that you had after World War II, where everything was, was auto-oriented. So if you go uh, just about three quarters of a mile from where I live, this street is only 20 feet between the curbs and it has parking on one side, it's a two-way street. And you think, well, how does this work? Do you have these horrible head-on collisions because there isn't room for two cars to pass? Well, no, you don't. The drivers know they have to go slow because they're gonna have to take turns to go by. Uh, it's actually a very safe street, much safer than some of your wider streets that you're building in more recent years. Uh, it also has the sidewalk set back about, uh, about 8 or 10 feet with a row of street trees there. Uh, that grass provides you know, a nice buffer from the cars, lets the rain on the sidewalk get soaked in rather than pouring straight into the storm drains. Uh, it serves a lot of purposes. And one of the things you'll notice here, there's a basketball hoop here. There is no danger to kids playing basketball on the street here. And there are so many localities now where they want to uh, pass laws to forbid kids from playing ball on the street. Well, the most significant public space in most neighborhoods, the thing that takes up the most space, is the street system. 
uh, you know, you're lucky if you have a park within walking distance, and, uh, and if you do, it's probably overcrowded anyway. But here, you know, there's no reason why the kids just can't go out, get a couple of their neighbors, you know, a little pickup game of basketball. None of this business of you have to have an organized event that all the soccer moms drive the kids to. So, but this is illegal in the many places around the country now because we have to worry about, you know, we can't, we can't let kids be in the automobile space. So let me, let me actually get to the topic of my talk, which is the three things that pedestrians need. This is the first thing they need, and that, this is a way to walk parallel to the road. You know, you're walking along the right of way trying to get to your destination. All too many places in the country, all you have is a little dirt trail. Uh, and when it rains, it's a mud trail. And since someone else is already talking about transit, I didn't bother showing you the shot with the bus stop pole next to the mud trail, which is all that transit riders get in many places because, as he mentioned, you're that strange place where they stepped off the bus, so it's not the transit authority's responsibility anymore, but the locality, which doesn't even bother putting in sidewalks anyway, oh, that's a transit problem because it's a bus stop, so it's, it's lost in limbo. Uh, the second thing that pedestrians need is a way to get across the street because not everything you want is on your block. And this is a, a typical suburban intersection that you have built nowadays. A zillion lanes to get across. Uh, this one, no crosswalks, no ped signals. Uh, it's, it's up to you to figure out when it's safe to go. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but the, the, the bus stop is located down there underneath the, the freeway overpass. And if you sit around and watch a while, um, you, if you have transit service, sooner or later you're going to have to cross the street because if you didn't have to cross it when you went to work, you have to cross it to get the bus to go home, unless you want to ride out to the end of the line. So, uh, so you watch here, and, and how do people get to that bus stop? Well, they don't cross at this corner. There's no reason why anyone would want to cross at this corner. They go down to mid-block and cross mid-block, st stand on the median until it's clear and cross the rest of the way. And that's actually a very sensible way to cross here, because at least you don't have turning cars there. Uh, and you can see, if you look here, there's actually a triple left turn lane here. So you have all three lanes coming at you with the left turners. The third thing that pedestrians need after you walk along the street and get across the street is some place to walk to. Living in the city, you're, you're actually lucky because a lot of things were designed 100 years ago when people did walk or they walked from transit. And so you typically have your neighborhood shops, you have a certain amount of mixed use. But you get out into any place that suffers from modern zoning and you don't have that advantage. And here you have a vast area of housing, and here you have a shopping center. And if you're in that house right there, you can stand on your back door and throw rocks at the shopping center. But you can't get there very easily because you have to go all the way down. This, they actually have a pedestrian connection here at the end of the cul-de-sac, which is better than a lot of places. So you don't have to go you know, miles out of your way. But you had to go all the way down here and down here and then make your way in to find out wherever the door is because it's over there on the other side where the parking lot is. What we've done with, with zoning where we've totally isolated different land uses means that any place interesting that you actually want to walk to is moved beyond walking distance. So, so sidewalks. Well, what's so complicated about putting in a sidewalk? Uh, well, one of the problems with things being foolproof is that fools are so clever about screwing things up. And, and so this, this is actually a fairly nice one. The, the house I used to live in was right back there. This is, this is an old sidewalk down in Atlanta, Georgia, where they don't have frost heaves that much in Atlanta. It's not like Minneapolis or somewhere. Uh, but you can see how ter terribly broken up that is. That sidewalk has probably not had a bit of maintenance since it was built however many decades ago it was. And so you get uh, you know, terribly, terrible tripping hazards. Um, you know, my mother would not want to walk along there. She'd you know, be in the hospital by the time she got to the end of the block. You have problems with, with shrubbery. You know, people plant these plants, they're nice little tiny plants, and they forget that little plants become big plants. And, you know, they may never walk there themselves. They climb in their car, they drive somewhere, and never realize that everyone that goes by their house has to contend with their, with their shrubbery. Or edging. Typically, you know, you have uh, four feet is really a little bit narrow for a sidewalk. Five feet or six feet is better. In the neighborhoods around here, you tend to have you know, much wider sidewalks. There actually, you can actually pass somebody without bumping elbows or, or walk next to someone and have a conversation. 
Uh, but when you start with a four foot sidewalk and then you, you've never edged it in the whole time you lived in your house, it can get narrower and narrower. These folks uh, weren't ambitious enough to, to shovel their sidewalk. They did, however, shovel their driveway and dump it on the sidewalk. In, in Maryland, uh, where I live, the uh, snow usually doesn't last very long except where it gets piled up, uh, such as on the sidewalk next to people's driveways. The uh, parking on the sidewalk is, is a chronic problem all over the world. Uh, I mean, I don't think I've ever been in a country where people didn't do it, and, and police are always complaining they have better things to do. Um, and, and this is just, and, and you can bet that there's a nice little oil spot right there underneath his engine, that, because he does it all the time, and nobody ever does anything about it. And there's, there's plenty of room farther up. There's plenty of legal on the street parking here. It's not like this is the only place he could park. Construction crews are notorious for sticking their, their construction ahead signs uh, in the sidewalk because it's the most convenient place for them to put it. Um, well, let me actually show you a, a good example here. This is from the city of Phoenix. Um, and they actually require re companies to shut off a lane of traffic if it's necessary to maintain pedestrian access during construction. And so, you, you know, you go around the country and you find good things in places you might not expect to find them. I would, never would have predicted that Phoenix would have been, uh, you know, real, uh, real diligent about maintaining uh, pedestrian access. And, and they'll have contractors complain at them because they have to rent the barricades and do everything else. And it can, uh, you know, if this is a fiber optic project that's going to be lasting for weeks along the whole length of this road, this could end up costing them thousands of dollars. Uh, but the city says you have to maintain pedestrian access, you're going to do it. And so they do. Okay, now, one of the problems you have with sidewalks is you tend to have, you end up with utility poles and other things with them. And they almost did things here. You know, you got the pole in the way, so you're going to expand the sidewalk so you have room to get around the pole. Uh, but the person wasn't quite clear on the concept. They went through a great deal. They put little expansion joints and everything else around that signpost. So there's, there'd be room to go by there, but there isn't quite enough room to squeeze through there. And so whoever is doing your work has to understand the concept that, that you need clear space around the pole. And, and after they spent all, all that trouble, you complain to the county, and then they move the sign over two feet, and you solve the problem. But, uh, one of the problems with, with fire plugs is, you know, they're in the middle of the sidewalk. You, you'd love to get them moved out of the way, but they complain, well, it's, it's too much money to move a fire plug. And, and so maybe you put the little sidewalk extension to go around it. Um, this is Montgomery County, Maryland, where I live. They're replacing the old fire plugs, which are decades old, with new ones. They have everything torn up. You know, they've torn up the valve where it goes to and the pipe under there and brand new fire plug there. It would have cost next to nothing to have used a slightly longer pipe to have the fire plug back at the back of the sidewalk instead of in the middle of it. But they don't understand the concept. It's never occurred to the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission that the, side, the fire plug doesn't belong in the middle of the sidewalk. And so they're going through tremendous expense to replace them anyway because they're old and not fixing the problem. And creating the awareness of pedestrian issues among all the bodies involved, not just the DOT, but the power company, the water company, everyone who touches that pedestrian environment uh, is a real challenge. Because you, you can't just go to the meetings that have pedestrian in the title. You need to go to every meeting, and no one has time. And even if that's all you ever did, you could never go to every meeting to use that word pedestrian. This is, this is actually interesting. This is uh, St. Genevieve, Missouri. The sidewalk here is only three feet wide. It's in Terribly narrow, you, you're going to walk single file on it. But the phone pole is outside the curb in the street. And your traffic engineers are all going, oh, we can't put poles in the street. Well, somebody did it. And you can get into the whole argument about how much space do, do pedestrians really need. I'm not asking for that much space. You know, I, I don't need that much. I'm not that greedy. But you know, at least give me more than the three feet in St. Genevieve. Brick sidewalks, some people really love brick sidewalks. Uh, I don't. Uh, they're never maintained well enough to keep out the tripping hazards. 
but you can still make your landscape architect happy. Uh, this is uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, but you can find this in, in many places, where your travel zone is concrete, which is easier to maintain without tripping hazards. But you've got your brick over in the furniture zone where you have your benches and your bike racks and trees and everything else. So, you know, you got your brick, you can get some aesthetic value in the environment, but you have a, a good smooth travel surface where you're less likely to have tripping hazards. Um, but once again, nothing's foolproof. Uh, this is actually near where I live, where the developer didn't want to go through all the expense of putting in a whole lot of brick. So their compromise was, well, we'll put concrete in the furniture zone and, and brick in the travel zone where people are going to trip over it. So um, once again, someone just, just not real clear on the concept. This is also something that I'm embarrassed to say got built in my county. Pedestrians like to travel in a straight line. You know, and if, 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 if straight lines don't appeal to you, find something else in the environment to make crooked. Um, and you can see, you know, they, the, the parts that go where they want to go, they walk on, and the parts that don't, they ignore and just make their own path. Unless it, you know, if it was really muddy, they might take the detour, but. And you'll find, you know, sidewalks like this. Everything else here is perfectly straight. The curb is perfectly straight. The fence is perfectly straight. And, and, and if you think that this is good for pedestrians, take your front, put three wines in your front walk between your front door and the street and walk on it every day and see how long you like it. <laughs> Americans with Disabilities Act says your maximum cross slope should be 2%. Uh, this is probably 20% maybe, and I'm not sure. Um, and this is where, uh, once again, you never know where you're gonna find good things. Uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas, I, I spent a, a day with the, the head of their sidewalk program, um, and their requirement for the sidewalk is 2% uh, above the curb, 2% cross slope continuous through the driveways. That's like a little mantra they have. And every developer in town knows it, and they do it. Um, these folks, you know, I don't know what was going through their mind, but they, they somehow missed, missed the mark here. And, and even, you know, this is, this is down in New Mexico. I don't think they have snow. But even if it was raining out, I don't think you could stay upright walking on that sidewalk. This is something Pennsylvania did. This is uh, Route 30 through York, Pennsylvania. And this is, this is not an interstate highway. This is just uh, old Route 30. Uh, you can see there's, there's some businesses down there. There are houses behind that sound wall. And you would have expected a sidewalk along here. Um, and there are parts of it where they just have the mud trail, and you think, well, DOT just didn't get around to building it. But then you get to this part, and you realize, no, DOT just doesn't like pedestrians. So they, they put in cobblestones where you would have a sidewalk, and uh, no pedestrian sign there. You, know, you just shake your head. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania DOT just... Uh, it has problems with pedestrians. <laughs> okay, getting across the street. Uh, the most basic uh, tool to get pedestrians across the street is, is the crosswalk. This is a, a, a zebra crossing in, in London, but other than some of the little design details, it's essentially equivalent to a crosswalk on an uncontrolled intersection in, in the United States. And, and the idea behind it is a pedestrian shows up, Traffic stops, the pedestrian crosses. As soon as the pedestrian's gone, traffic starts again. You minimize delay for the pedestrian. You minimize uh, delay for the driver because they only have to stop as long as the pedestrian's there, and then they can go, and the cars stop as soon as the pedestrians get there, and um, then they can go. So uh, crosswalk laws are virtually identical in every state in the U.S. You know, there's some differences. Some say stop, some say yield, some say on the adjacent lane, some say anywhere in the street, some say on the curb, some say stepping off the curb, but they're, they're basically identical. You travel around the U.S. and you would never know that. Uh, there's a handful of places, a few places on the West Coast, a few places in New England where crosswalks work the way they're supposed to, and um, pedestrians actually find they, that the right-of-way is honored. Uh, but you go other places and you know, people wonder, well, is the law different here? And no, it's the same law. It's just the, the culture of driving 
has, has somehow come to the point where crosswalk laws are just totally ignored. And you have to be a little careful, either as a pedestrian or a driver, to know what the local culture is, or you're going to get run over, or you're going to run someone over. Um, there are a lot of variations on the crosswalk. This is uh, something they do in uh, uh, Melbourne, Australia, where they have uh, called a flag crossing. They had a crossing guard to help the children get out of school safely. This is a mid-block crossing next to a school. Um, one thing that's very uh, popular in the United States now is these little little pylons in the middle with uh, the, the crosswalk laws, you know, stop or yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. Those are still fairly new. They're not actually in the, the manual for uniform traffic control devices yet. Um, so you're actually, you know, violating federal standards if you stick one in the street, but uh, they're so popular that they're sprouting up all over the place. And you get up to a certain, certain speed, certain volume of, of pedestrian and auto traffic, and you end up going to the traffic signal where each person has their own time during the signal phase to go, uh, which means, you know, inherently you're going to have more delay than the crosswalk. It's sort of a shame that the crosswalks don't work better than they do because the idea of minimizing delay is, uh, you know, is, is a major part of, of their function. Um, and signal timing in this country is, uh, is, is pretty awful in a lot of places because in terms of, of maximizing delay, um, there are many places where you have two-minute or even three-minute signals. And then they wonder why pedestrians just cross when they see a gap. Well, no one's going to sit there for three minutes unless you, you know, gave them a book to read or something. So uh, now this is actually an example of an intersection. It's skewed. This is at an angle to here. And which means your crossing distance is going to be maybe uh, somewhere between a third and a half longer than it would be if it was at right angles. And here they tried to minimize your crossing distance by having it go at right angles, but it means if you're going up this street, you've kind of gone out of your way. And you know, a, lot, a lot of those details in intersection design um, can make a big difference for pedestrians in terms of, of, of safety, but also comfort and convenience. Just you know, do you feel you had a good experience after you crossed the street here? And, and a lot of people m might say no. A lot of suburban areas, your pedestrian traffic's a, a little lighter, and you have traffic engineers that figure, well, maybe we don't have to accommodate pedestrians here. Well, if you're going to have any kind of pedestrian traffic at all, you do need to accommodate pedestrians. Uh, what they've done here, they have got a, have a regular walk signal across the one leg of this intersection. Uh, the other leg of the intersection, uh, they don't have a walk signal, but they do have a button you can press that will make sure that that green light stays on long enough for you to actually get across the street. Because otherwise, it'd only give you about five seconds to cross the street um, before it turned yellow and then the oncoming traffic would come on. And I think it's like a, a five or six lane street. It wouldn't be enough time for you. So they weren't going to put in a separate pet head for you, but they at least make it possible for you to get enough time to get across the street. And this is something that, uh, you know, any professional engineer should know they have to do that, and all too often they don't. And it's an attitude, well, no one should be crossing there or, or some other attitude. And, uh, but people are going to cross, and you do need to make it safe for them. OK, other, other variations on the crosswalk. Once again, it's a very simple thing, but it's not so simple. This is a raised crosswalk. We've got a sign there. And so cars are going to have to slow down uh, before they go over it. Or, or they're going to, uh, you know, damage their suspension. Um, now, once again, details are often very important for pedestrians. Uh, this is actually a kind of a steep drop off and then a steep rise on the end there, where, where the curb ramp comes down and then you go up for the bump. Uh, if you design them properly, you won't have that. And in fact, um, when my mother crosses here, she actually walks next to the crosswalk because she finds it difficult to do that steep drop and, and steep rise. So the, the little design details can be important. Uh, one way to actually get around that, other than figuring out how to make it flush at the curb without fouling up your, your storm drainage, is to actually have the speed bump shortly before the crosswalk. And so the cars are going to have to slow down for that speed bump, and they'll still be going slow uh, for the crosswalk. And, and when, when cars go slow, they're more likely to actually obey pedestrian laws and, and stop. Okay. This, this is a uh, curb extensions. So that the, to reduce the, the pedestrian crossing distance. And once again, the details are important on this. And I'm here to talk about peds rather than bikes. But if you have bike lanes, 
uh, that curb extension can't go out any farther than the, the edge of the parked cars would go out, or all of a sudden you're going to have a pinch point for cyclists. So, um, so when they're talking about pedestrian improvements, you have to have someone there that understands cycling as well. But the idea is reduce the crossing distance, uh, make it more obvious to vehicles that pedestrians are going to be crossing there. Here's something uh, similar, but uh, it's uh, raised the pedestrian refuge island. So you only have to cross the two lanes, you have a safe refuge, and then worry about the other direction of traffic, the other two lanes. And where you have multiple lanes, uh, this has turned out to be one of the innovations that can do the most to increase pedestrian safety. Uh, people love to play with statistics on that. If just putting in a crosswalk seems maybe it's going to be a little hazardous, well, you don't decide to just keep people from crossing there. What else do you need to do to make it safe for pedestrians? And, and one of the things you might be able to do that'll help is put in a, a raised refuge island. And raised, not just paint on the pavement, but something that cars are not going to want to cross over. A lot of people want to put in fancy decorative crosswalks. They don't like white paint. You know, that's too, I don't know, too highway. Um, this is what the pedestrian sees. But this is what the driver sees. It's almost invisible. For a raining out or a dark out, it would be invisible. You know, there's a lot of talk about, well, do crosswalks create a false sense of, of confidence in, in pedestrians? Um, well, certainly this type of crosswalk would, because the pedestrian can see it and the driver can't. If your highway paint has really faded because you never bothered to repaint it, it's the same thing. It'll still be quite visible to pedestrians, but the drivers won't be able to see it very well. So here's a, a, a brick crosswalk where they still put in the white stripes. And those white stripes, reflective paint, is going to show up at night. It'll show up uh, at, least, at least some in the rain. More, much more so than the brick will. Um, but I've, I've got a problem with brick crosswalks for the same reason I have a problem with brick sidewalks. The entire surface of this road is nice and smooth, except where you want pedestrians to walk on it. So here, this is what Milwaukee has done. They've got a nice, smooth, concrete crosswalk, so the pedestrians have a smooth place to cross, and they put the bumpy stuff with the pavers on either side of it. So you still get that nice rumble that the, for the cars to know that there's something there, but the pedestrians don't have to worry about you know, tripping on it or rolling over it in their wheelchair or, or whatever. So they still should have some white paint here somewhere because this won't show up at night at all. But at least you aren't making the pedestrians go on the bumpy part. Americans with Disabilities Act was passed more than a decade ago. Um, there's still a lot of places in the U.S. where they haven't put in the curb ramps for, for wheelchairs. Uh, they're also actually really good for strollers or someone with wheeled luggage or someone with a hand truck or a grocery cart. Um, this is actually a, a real nice corner design. This is actually from the same neighborhood where I showed you that basketball hoop in the 20-foot streets. The radius here on this corner, engineers measure the curvature of a corner by the radius of that, of that curb, five feet. That would be illegal to build nowadays. You have a separate curb ramp for each sidewalk that leads you straight into the path you want to take across the street to the other side. What you see so often is people try to get cheap and they put in one diagonal curb cut that puts you right out in the middle of the intersection so that people from both directions can hit you. And and a car seeing you waiting there at the curb doesn't know which street you want to cross, so they can't stop for you. Details are important for pedestrians. Uh, you know, the cars going down the street don't care that you have puddles collect here, but anyone going down that, that uh, curb ramp will. So having a drain somewhere might be a good idea, but you probably don't want to put it right in the ramp. You got high heels, a cane, uh, maybe the caster wheels on a wheelchair. It could have problems getting caught in that grate. And there's a lot going on in this shot. This is a, a cobblestone street in St. Louis, and, and you don't want one of these outside your bedroom because the cars do make a lot of noise going on it. Um, but they've got uh, a smooth asphalt surface for the crosswalk, so you don't have to worry about the, the rough cobblestones. Uh, and, it's, and it's painted, you have the stripes there, and it's kind of poor maintenance. The asphalt's not quite as bumpy as the cobblestones yet, but it's, it's getting a lot of patches in it, and the paint's kind of fainted. So that's where they put the curb ramp. 
the right hand's not talking to the left hand, and, and someone just doesn't quite understand the concept. Okay, mid-block crossings. Mid-block crossings uh, can be important if you have destinations that are mid-block. You know, if the door to your building is in the middle of the block and the door to the shopping center is in the middle of the block right across from it, people are going to want to cross there. In this case, there's a school over here on the left with its ball fields, and there's some more ball fields over here on the right. Uh, and so this is the way the kids get across. They even put in a signal there, which is a, uh, a little unusual for a mid-block crossing to go through that much trouble, but they figured it was important to get the kids safely across to the ball fields. Uh, this is a mid-block crossing in St. Louis. That's, that's a 30-foot uh, a retaining wall there. <laughs> And behind me, going the other direction, there's a wall going down uh, to the Mississippi River. And you could probably stand here for a week and never see anybody actually use that crosswalk. And, um, and I have no idea what committee decided that that was where to put it. Um, now this crosswalk, they, they very carefully, it used, to, it used to be here, and they decided, well, we better restripe it over at this angle instead. Uh, I guess it wasn't aimed quite directly at that clump of, of weeds there. Um, so, so the crosswalks are only part of the system. They have, they have to link up to something. Um, this is actually something good going on. This is, this is a horrendous intersection. Uh, to get from this corner over to that corner, we have to cross 10 lanes. There's a right turn lane, three through lanes, two left turn lanes, three through lanes, and another right turn lane. Um, but it, until recently, there hasn't been anything, any provision there for pedestrians. Uh, they're putting in uh, little raised islands uh, where the right turn lane slips off so that you have a, a refuge spot there rather than just paint that everyone drives over. They're putting in, they're extending the median past where the crosswalk's going to be and have a cut going through it for the crosswalk. And this is actually uh, the proper way to do it. It frequently isn't done. But having that little extra bit out there means that someone turning left isn't going to cut that corner uh, too broad and, and hit you while you're even going across the other half of the road. And anything you can do to, to slow down turning vehicles and sort of confine them to where they should be uh, is likely to help pedestrians because it's the turning vehicles that are most likely to get you at an intersection. Um, and so, it's, I mean, it's still going to be a nuisance to go across 10 lanes, but at least they give you a little refuge to break it up into pieces. Uh, but this is, this is what's been happening to too many roads in the U.S. They're, they cut out a row of trees here. They're moving the curb over about three feet. They're moving the curb on the other side of the street over a few feet so they can squeeze a fifth lane into this road so people can make left turns without interrupting the flow of traffic. And, so, I mean, other than losing the trees, which eventually will grow back, I guess, um, you know, you're losing sidewalk space, you're increasing the distance to go across the road. And, and this, tends, this happens in little tiny increments. You know, they, you widen something here, you widen something there, and pretty soon you discover it's, it's tougher to get across the streets and the traffic's going faster and you have less space on the sidewalk. And, and if you've narrowed it down enough, you know, people might not even want to walk by there because it's, it's so unpleasant to be that close to cars. Um, and this is another thing that's happening. This is the old corner. You know, I talked about curb radii before. That's maybe about a 10-foot radius. The new radius is maybe 30 feet. And this is going to do two things to you. One is, look how much extra distance you're going to have to go just to get to where you were before on the curb. You're adding uh, maybe at least 10 feet to your crossing distance, which, by the way, will mean you have to add a few seconds to the signal length to give people extra time to cross. But, uh, but just as bad is cars going around this corner are going to be able to go a whole lot faster than cars going around that other corner. And so extra crossing distance, increased speed of turning cars. If your traffic engineer doesn't understand those two effects of widening your curb radii, they need to go back to school and, and get educated. Um, and, and this is happening all over the country, and it's going to make it that much difficult to get across the street. Uh, other ways to get across the street. How about putting up uh, pedestrian bridges? Uh, and this was one uh, shopping center over here. Uh, Prince George's Plaza Shopping Center. Prince George's Plaza Metro, uh, Metro Rail Station on the, on the right-hand side in suburban Washington. 
This bridge probably cost them at least a million dollars, and you can see the people there. If they don't perceive the bridge as convenient, they aren't going to use it. And, and you can see that worn the median there is. I mean, you, you see as many people going on the surface using the, the bridge to give them shade as you do actually on the bridge. Uh, tunnels. Uh, will tunnels work? Well, there are places where tunnels will work, but if they're short and narrow and too long and kind of scary, uh, people aren't going to want to use them. So when, when will bridges work? Well, if you have a long desire line that forms a natural ramp up for the bridge, it might work. And this is a, a rail trail conversion where they have it slowly slope up, go across the bridge, and then slowly slope down on the other side. It's on your path of travel. You don't perceive it as inconvenient to use this bridge, so you'll use it. And this, this one's, you know, you'll see most of the people on this bridge and not crossing under it, like in uh, the Prince George's Plaza one. Um, if you're going across an obstacle that you can't cross at the surface, an interstate highway, you want to have a lot of pedestrian bridges so you can get to the other side. Uh, a river, you need to be able to get to the other side of the river, you'll need bridges for that. Or a, a railroad switching yard, where you have, if you have more than two railroad tracks, you're going to probably want to, um, well not, it could be more than two tracks, but if you have a switch yard where trains moving back and forth, you're going to need, a, uh, need bridges to get people across. This one across I-270 in, in St. Louis, they have three little steps up there. They have one step going down on the other side. This is probably built back late 60s, maybe 1970. Um, and people back then kind of, you know, people didn't have wheelchairs back then, so you didn't worry about things like that. But since they passed the ADA a decade ago and people now use wheelchairs, um, you know, they could do something to ramp people up over those three steps so that someone could actually, in a wheelchair, could actually get across the highway because otherwise you have to go you know, miles out of your way to get to another way across that might not be any better. Uh, so you, you, you hopefully would never build something like that today without doing something about those steps, but you know, the retrofit process to fix all the bad stuff we built is extremely slow. Uh, you have an awful lot of bridges where they didn't bother putting in a sidewalk. Uh, you need to get across whatever it's going over. What do you do? Well, that's why yeah, you, you grab a taxi or a helicopter. In, in this case, uh, Columbia, Missouri, they're building a, a parallel bridge that can be used by pedestrians um, and, and so you can get out of the traffic stream there. And it's a little pricey, but it's not as expensive as rebuilding the road bridge. And you have to be able to get pedestrians safely across these obstacles. You know, you didn't do it right 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, so you, you know you're gonna have to pay the price to, to get it fixed because um, in in this case I think they're only doing it on one side the other side is actually an industrial area with a railroad track so it's um, you know ideally if, I mean if you were building that bridge new you'd like to have a sidewalk on both sides because you don't want to have force people to make unnecessary road crossings um, in, in, in this case, under the circumstances, uh, if I was a pit advocate there, I'd, I'd be satisfied that they're doing it on the one side because the uses on the other side aren't going to have that intensive a pedestrian flow. But, uh, okay, this is a case where you have a road going under an interstate. Uh, there wasn't room on the one side of the pillars to put the path, but you can ramp it up and put it behind the, the pillars and still get through underneath the interstate there. Uh, once again, they kind of goofed up on the details because uh, they got the slope here wrong and you end up with a big mud puddle there. And, and you, there's actually a little worn path there where people walk to get around the mud puddle. So um, you know, they, they got the concept right, just didn't, didn't get quite all the details right. And this is, this is our friends in, in Pennsylvania again. And I'm only picking on them because I've seen more no pedestrian signs there than any place else in the country. They got a no pedestrian crossing sign there for going this way. There's also one for going the other leg. You cannot leave this corner of the intersection unless you go 22,000 miles around the world the other way to approach it from the other direction. So um, Pennsylvania thought they solved their, their pedestrian problems by putting up a lot of no pedestrian signs. 
there are still pedestrians in Pennsylvania. They're just unhappy, unhappy pedestrians, you know, struggling against the stuff that the Department of Transportation built. Okay, the hurry on to the third thing that pedestrians need is some place to walk to. And typically what we have nowadays is you have your, your housing pod with you know, plenty of driveways and garages, um, your office park pod where you have all your office buildings way behind big lawns and big parking lots, so it, it's a major chore to get there from the bus stop or to go even between the two office buildings. And you have your, your shopping pod. You know, with, with a huge parking lot out in front, uh, they have an ordinance that requires green space there, so they got a little tree there. <laughs> and I'm standing over near the McDonald's, and if I was going to go to the Walmart next, I'd probably get in my car and, and drive it over to the Walmart parking lot, just because it's, you know, that's too unfriendly to walk, even though it, it, it's walking distance. Walking distance is partly a function of, is it pleasant to walk? If it's pleasant, people will walk a long ways. Uh, if it's like this, they'll drive to as close as they can get to the door. And, uh, and the, the other thing that makes the modern development patterns nasty is the, the road pattern. You know, the, the grid like you have in, uh, in this part of Chicago gives you lots of choices to get places uh, on how you're going to go. Typical modern suburban, uh, you have your big arterials, and then you have your collector streets, and then your little pedestrian streets, and then you end up on cul-de-sacs. And to go from the end of one cul-de-sac to the end of the other cul-de-sac, uh, if they didn't put a little pedestrian connection through, you might have to go a mile to get out to the arterial and back in on the other collector street. So cul-de-sac is just a fancy word for dead end. Um, and to make it worse, uh, a lot of shopping centers assume everyone's going to, or everyone they want, is going to arrive by car. And this shopping center, they, they put up a fence here. They got new management, and they wanted to keep people from you know, cutting across the parking lot. So you now have to go down to the driveway and share the space with every car going in and out, because there's no sidewalk next to the driveway, rather than going across the quiet corner. There used to be a donut shop here that uh, left when their lease ran out, because all the people that took the subway stop behind me that used to just dash across and grab a donut on their way to the, the bus or home from the bus uh, can't get there anymore without going you know, down here and back. And, and so, uh, you know, so there's at least one merchant that understood how important pedestrians were to their business, but the management did not. And so these artificial constructs separate uses more than they have to be. And you go around the country and you can find a zillion places where people have punched holes through the fences, cut holes through chain link fences, duck under them, go over them figure out some way to make shortcuts to make the system work. But why couldn't we put a gate in there and give pedestrians good access rather than making them you know, punch boards out of the fence? OK, this is a uh, case in terms of making things farther apart by making them unpleasant. You, know, you got a sidewalk here, your, your green space required by code to make it nice and pleasant to walk here. Um, but you have this huge blank wall, and because you don't even have any windows looking out on the street, you have to have a little security camera because there's no other way anybody would have eyes on the street. And uh, just an absolutely miserable place to be. Um, this is a pedestrian mall in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And you'd think of all places where you'd want to connect with pedestrians, they have the, the bottom five feet of the windows blanked out. You should have big display windows connect with those pedestrians in the pedestrian mall. Uh, Walgreens, they have their standard corporate standards for how to do a store and don't understand what a pedestrian mall means. And, and then you wonder why maybe the pedestrian mall doesn't have as many pedestrians as you'd like. Um, in contrast, this is uh, you know, Market Street in Philadelphia. It's a busy, quite a busy street. You have a lot of traffic there. But at least you have a broad sidewalk, you know, full-size windows on the stores, entrances out to the sidewalk, uh, so you can interact with the stores, benches to sit down when you're tired, you know, pay phones, uh, news racks, uh, you know, hot dog vendors, uh, um, you know, all sorts of things that make it an interesting place to be an active street, both connecting to the buildings and connecting to the activity on the street. 
um, benches. I'm, I'm ashamed to say this is the town I live in. Wide street, you're sort of on the edge of the commercial area. This, this, this poor senior citizen with her little three-wheel walker thing, um, looking for a place to, to rest for a few minutes, uh, has to sit on the edge of a little retaining wall in front of a building that has absolutely nothing to offer the pedestrian going by. And uh, the only positive thing I can say is at least they didn't put the little metal spike strips on there to keep her from sitting down for a few minutes. Um, but that's probably just because building management didn't look out there and see her, because they'll, they'll be doing that next. Um, we need to give people benches to sit on, and if people are worried that homeless people will sit on the benches, tell me how many homeless people you have, put down 10 times as many benches, and that way 90% of them will all be available for the desirable people or whatever. Okay, you're a pedestrian, you want to know where you're going. Uh, this is what I call one-way street sign syndrome. Cars are coming toward us on this one-way street. They put the street name up on the mast arm. But since there aren't any cars going the other direction, they don't bother putting one facing the other direction. Uh, well, pedestrians go both directions on a sidewalk. And so you have to cross the street and look back to see where you just were. Um, so what you want to do is, is put on you know, supplement the mast arm signs with the blade signs on the post. Uh, the problem is this is uh, Peachtree Center Avenue down in Atlanta. Uh, the optimal height in their manual for the blade signs is the same as the optimal height in their manual for the pedestrian head. If you want to know that it's Auburn Avenue that you're about to cross, you still have to cross the street and look back because they blocked it. And, and this is a case where I don't think you need to give your employees drug tests. I think you need to give them IQ tests. <laughs> um, and I, and I just, <clears throat> I see stuff like this all over, and I just scratch my head, going, "Who did this?" The only thing that's, that's important is wayfinding signs. These are, these are in downtown DC. They're actually quite good. They have sort of a wider area map to orient you in the city. The subway map. These are generally outside of subway stations, so you can figure out how to get around on transit. And then uh, a detailed area map with uh, shows you a five minute walk, 10 minute walk, shows you important buildings um, and, and places you might actually want to go to. Now and contrast this with a uh, map out in a street, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say where I live again, where they, well they do have a couple other things on the map if you interpret what they are. But the most prominent thing on this map is they're showing you where the parking lots are. And, and so it's, um, I'm a little disappointed in this. That's, that's all I'll say. Big thing you're going to see in the next few years is uh, safe routes to school. Uh, there's probably going to be an initiative on that in the federal reauthorization. Uh, Congressman James Oberstar of Minnesota is going to be pushing for it. Uh, this is a school crossing. In New Mexico, the school's half a block off to the left there. There's enough space here for six lanes of traffic. It's supposed to be one lane in each direction. They've got more than enough room. Um, they could do curb extensions here to cut two-thirds of the crossing distance off for the, for the kids, shorten their crossing time, slow up the cars a little bit. Um, this is a, this is a, the, the subdivision here, this is Poolsville, Maryland. Subdivision's required to put in sidewalks now. This is where the edge of the school grounds is, and there's the school. Uh, the school system wasn't required to put in the sidewalks to connect to it. Um, this is Ashwibanon, Wisconsin. Uh, they figured out that they could save enough on busing kids, hazard busing, in, in six years to pay for sidewalks. And they even have the place for the sidewalks in the, in the public right of way. But you have the NIMBYs that opposed it so what they did instead was they painted a, a little stripe on the edge of the road so the kids can have a stripe to protect them when they walk in the street. This is Mary Knoll Avenue uh, where I live. Uh, similar situation, they've got the right of way there, they're trying to get sidewalks built, they have NIMBY opposition, people who have privatized that public land as a, an extension of their private front lawn. Uh, so your you know, family's walking to school in the street. Fortunately, I think the Department of Transportation here has um, enough intestinal fortitude to go ahead and build this sidewalk, even though there is uh, some opposition by some of the homeowners. 
Um, and so uh, hopefully by this time next year, those people will be walking to school on a sidewalk. Uh, this is Beachway Drive in Fairfax, Virginia. This sidewalk got put in after a uh, little girl was uh, struck and killed walking home from school in the street. And this is what we don't want to see. We don't want to see sidewalks as memorials to dead pedestrians. Let's get them in first. And this is, this is my last slide. Um, this is the police investigation paint uh, about 300 feet from where I live. Woman who uh, lived three doors down from me uh, walking uh, home one night, uh, 10 minutes to 10, crossing at the intersection, uh, about 100 feet from her front door, uh, got run over and killed. And you read the police investigation, and the police investigation, the car had the green light. They say uh, it's the failure of the pedestrian to yield right away to the motorist. It does not look at all at the intersection. And the intersection, it's an actuated intersection that only automobiles can actuate on the cross street there. Even if they do actuate, there's only seven seconds to get across seven lanes of traffic. And so, but it's state DOT policy not to put in a crosswalk or a pedestrian signal there because there's no sidewalk on the cross street. And so it's that sort of bureaucratic attitude that it doesn't meet our standards for putting in pedestrian improvements uh, that means that things don't get fixed. You know, even, even after we've had a fatality, nothing's changed there. Um, but that's, that's not why I actually got started doing the pedestrian program. It's not, this happened after I was doing the TV series. Um, and I don't do it because 6,000 pedestrians and bicyclists get killed every year or the, the 100,000 that are wounded. Um, and I don't do it because of the 200 or 300,000 people who die early every year because they don't get enough physical activity, which is a public health issue that just now is, is coming to light. But I do it because I remember back when I was walking to school in Evanston, Illinois, and how wonderful it was to be able to walk places and how crucial a walkable place is to quality of life. So thank you and enjoy your lunch. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org. <laughs>